Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Grateful for his word. The Spirit of God uses the word of God to minister and continue to move today. Look forward to sharing this message with you. Welcome. Everyone at Calvary, welcome our guests. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be playing the role of Dorothy today and I would do announcements at the end, um, but just wanna welcome our guests here at Calvary. Thank you for coming and for those online, we would love to connect with you afterwards in the lobby, just say hi if you have a moment to do that. And we've been in the middle of our play, so things look a little different up here, don't they? And we've had seven, just confirmed it's hard to get everyone in the, in the room when they raise their hands to give their life to Jesus, but we've confirmed 17 responses so far to the gospel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we have one more show today at two, and we're looking forward to that. The cast and crew have been amazing. Some of the worship team members are doing overtime today. They, <laughs> they've been in the play as well, and our tech team. So we're grateful for, for everything that's going on and what God's doing. We're, on our, we're in our series on the road to the cross. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 17 and uh, we'll have it on the screen as well for you. I wanna give you some context of our message today. Uh, in the book of John, from John 12 all the way to the end, it focuses on the, the last days of Christ. And today would actually be Palm Sunday. It's the day where Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, and then things would get dramatic from there. And from that point on, he went into the temple and saw that there was pretty much um, crime going on in two ways. One, the extortion of money and overcharging prices for sacrifices for Passover, and Jesus did not like that. And the other problem is they were doing that in the Gentile court uh, where the Gentiles would worship uh, separate from the Jews. And Jesus was not happy with that because he wanted all people to be able to worship him. And hearing loud animals and exchanging money where you're supposed to worship is not cool. And so Jesus clears out that court and says, get out of here, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. Well, that, you know, that caused a little stir. Jesus knew how to stir the pot. He knew when to do it though. And, you know, when he came into Jerusalem, that was the first time he accepted public honor and embraced that. And now he's stirring the pot. And I was reading through the chronological order of the Bible um, this, this past year, and I'm still in it. And I noticed that the last week of Jesus' life, he has a lot of confrontations with the Pharisees. And it makes sense because he hung out in Jerusalem a lot his last week where the Pharisees dwelled most of the time. So you'll read a lot of confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees. They're trying to plot his death and uh, they lie and they do all these things. Judas gives up Jesus, unfortunately, for money. And, um, and then what we see though is the Last Supper. So we go from Jesus entering Jerusalem uh, to flipping over some tables in the temple uh, to confronting some Pharisees. Then he's at the Last Supper where he would spend four chapters in the book of John, or John would do that, four to five chapters of their last conversation together. It's a beautiful, beautiful few chapters to read. And he has the last supper. There he, um, he reveals that Judas would betray him. And he also says that Peter would deny him. And then he says, if I go, the Holy Spirit will come. So it's good if I go because you want the Holy Spirit to come. And uh, they don't like that. They're concerned. And um, he, says, he says in John 15, when I go, you know, I need you to remain in me. Well, how can you remain in, in God if he leaves? Well, that would be the Holy Spirit. And so John 14, he introduces the Holy Spirit coming if he leaves. John 15, remain in me. John 16, he says, your grief, you will grieve for a little while, but then your grief will turn to joy. And he's, he talks about the Holy Spirit again. So Jesus is about to face the cross and he's trying to reassure his disciples that, hey, it's gonna be okay. I'm sending my spirit. Your grief will turn to joy. Uh, and I love what the last verse of John 16 says. 
I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Amen. Well, we don't really necessarily hear about John 17 very often. But right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays, he prays for us. Before he goes to his bogus trials that they're going to put him through, that they lie and deceive, before he goes to the cross, do you know what Jesus does? Jesus prays. And I, I really was edified and encouraged by this prayer as I studied it because it taught me how do I handle my trials? How should I face my trials? And Jesus prays for us. And what's really cool about John chapter 17 is we get a look into his private life and his private prayer life. I don't know about you, but that's, that's intriguing. Like what would Jesus pray, you know, in a time where he's about to be crucified? You may be surprised today. Lord, thank you for this word. Would you speak to us and may your spirit speak through your word guide us and teach us your truth. Help us to apply it too. And help me, Lord. May I decrease so that you may increase. In Jesus' name, amen. John 17, verse 1. Jesus actually begins praying for himself. And it says, after saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. He's talking about himself. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Wow, it's beautiful. Father, the hour has come. Many times Jesus said, my time has not come yet. My hour has not come yet. Now it has come. The hour of trial and suffering for Jesus. Why? Why did he have to go through this? It says here to glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. Jesus longed to glorify God with his sacrifice. He says that he gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. I love this. He says to know God, not to have knowledge of God so much so, but to know God in a personal relationship. And of course, we have to know who God is in order to have that knowing relationship with him. Amen? To know God is to have eternal life. And we know from John 14, 6, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man shall come to the Father except through me. And so eternal life is given through faith in Christ. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, we then have eternal life. Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of mankind. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because that means we're, we have nothing to fill us if we don't have the eternal God. See, the eternal God fits perfectly in your eternal, eternal heart. The eternal hole that you have can never be filled. We call it the God-shaped hole. It can't be filled with the things of this world. It must be filled with God who is eternal. Eternal life is not just a possession like a gift that you put on a shelf. Eternal life is a relationship with God. Your heart will never be satisfied without a relationship with God. I love what Augustine said. He said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You will be restless. You will be wandering. You'll be a vagabond as we sang in the first song, a wanderer. You'll be looking for something to satisfy you and you will never find it until you find the eternal God who can always satisfy. <laughs> Praise the Lord.
You may be asking in your chair right now, in your pew, well, wait a minute, Ryan, I'm still struggling to satisfy my soul. Well, right now we have a part of eternal life. We have a taste of eternal life. We have eternal life now. We have already inherited it, but we don't have it in full yet. And that's why we long and hope for Jesus to come back so we can have it in full and fully experience what eternal life is. We go down to verse four and Jesus says, I brought you glory, I brought glory to you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. He didn't even do the cross yet, but he knows he's getting ready to go to it. He's so committed to the cross as we talked about last week. He's already saying, I'm completing your work. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Let me tell you, if you don't fall in love with Jesus more after this prayer, I don't know what's gonna help you. This is an amazing prayer. (laughs) He gave up glory. He gave up being by the side of his Father to come down here in this messy world and deal with us and love us. And now he's saying, Lord, I long to be back in your glory. He forfeited his glory so that he could bring you into glory. Wow. Wow. How amazing must heaven be next to God that he wants to be there. He wants to go back. God, I did my work. Bring me back into your glory. That's his prayer. And Jesus cares about giving God glory. Look at verse six. I have revealed you, or we can say glorified you to the ones you gave me from this world. He's talking about the disciples. Now he prays for his disciples. They were always yours. You gave them to me. And here's the thing. They were chosen for a task. God chose these disciples and Jesus chose them. This is unique because rabbis didn't choose The difference is Jesus did. See, what happens is rabbis would want people to come pick them. Jesus picked his disciples. He prayed first and then he picked them for a task, but because of free will, they still had to accept what he taught. And look what it says next. You have gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you for I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. The disciples weren't perfect, but at least they believed. At least they accepted what Jesus passed on about God. Then he goes on and continues to pray for his disciples. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. Well, wait a second, Ryan. He doesn't care about the world? Yes, of course he does. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. John, in in the book of John, the word world means anyone who's separate from God because of their sin. Anyone who's still lost, that's the world. Jesus cares deeply about them, but right now he's focusing on his disciples who are in the world. He wants them to impact the world. So he's praying specifically for them because God's gonna use them to reach the world. So make sure we don't get that twisted. Some people read that verse and go, see, God doesn't love us. Yes, he does. The context is everything. He says this, verse 10, all who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. Now, if you're the disciples hearing this right now, in which we don't know exactly. Did he pray this separately? Did he pray this in the garden of Gethsemane first? All we do know is that John was so close to Jesus, he heard these words and he had them documented by the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. That's how close John was. So he hears these words and they're probably wondering, wait a minute, he's, he really is leaving us. He's now praying about this. And this is what Jesus says in verse 11. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. Verse 12, during my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. He's talking about Judas. Judas, well, his priorities were different. Judas was not accepting and believing everything. He was one foot in the world and one foot out of the world, one foot in the world and one foot in Christ and money took over his heart and Satan entered him and he led Jesus to be, he, he betrayed Jesus. This doesn't make Jesus a failure. It doesn't make him a failure because we have free will to choose whether we'll do that or not. 
he was headed for destruction. But God protects us by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus is praying here? Lord, help them persevere. Help them persevere because they're gonna stay here and I'm leaving, so protect them while they are here and protect them by the name you have given me. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. When demons heard the name Jesus, they shrieked and were scared and fell back. When, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, they said, are you, the, are you the Messiah, the one? He said, I am he. They fell back. They fell back. I believe it's because of the glory that came from that statement. They were hit so hard. There's power in the name. Jesus prayed that God would protect us because he's leaving, that he would protect us so that they could persevere. I love that. Now he goes on to say this in verse 13. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things. He's still talking to God, his father. I told them many things. He's referring to the disciples while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. So they would be filled with my joy. They were gonna go through some hard things. And so these, these words, at first they would forget them because of the pain and the sorrow and the grief, but then they would remember that the Holy Spirit's gonna come and that they have joy, that they can face their trials that they're about to see Jesus go through in their own lives. They can face it because there's still joy in the promises that Jesus gave. When I was studying this, it reminded me of Hebrews chapter 12, verse two. And for some reason, I'm not able to find it on my notes. Let me see if I can find it here. Here it is. Jesus, uh, Hebrews 12, one says, let us run with endurance the race set before us. Well, Jesus, um, talking about Jesus's perseverance, this is what it says. We do this. We run the race with endurance set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him the joy after the cross. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside, beside God's throne. What is he saying here? What is the, the author of Hebrews saying? Jesus was willing to face the shame and go through the shame of the cross. Just don't, don't forget, he was half naked on the cross. He was insulted, beaten, spit on. That's shameful to treat Jesus that way. He was willing to endure that shame because of the joy before him that was coming after the cross to be back with his father in glory. We can face tomorrow because he lives. We are not afraid because he lives. We're filled with joy because he lives. His promises are yes and amen. There's joy in the middle of this chapter because there's joy in the middle of being in the presence of God. Verse 14, I have given them your word. He's talking about the disciples still. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Well, get, you better buckle up. In fact, there will come a time where we're hated so much that people will think it's, they're doing the right thing by persecuting and hurting us, just like they thought they were doing with Jesus. And I have to say, if I'm not being hated, I'm probably not living right. When it comes time, if, I'm, if people don't hate me, then maybe I'm not bold and, and unashamed for Jesus enough, because it's gonna come. I mean, he, he, he warned us, they're gonna hate you because you don't belong to this world. You don't fit in with this world, my friends. And guess what? It's okay. It's okay. Why? Not because we want the world to feel terrible about everything. No, because we want to save the world. We wanna save those who are still lost. but there's going to be scoffers. There's going to be mockers. There's going to be people that insult you and say disgusting things about our God because they hate him. That's why they hate us. So don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Just praise God through the persecution. Just know they hate, they hate you because they first hated him, according to Jesus. Verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. 
Ah, there you go. We have to persevere in this world. Protect us, God, in this world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one, the devil. I'm not asking you to take them out. I'm asking you to keep them there, but to keep them, to protect them, to help them persevere because people need Jesus. People need the gospel. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Okay, so there you have it. The first few uh, verses, it's all about the glory of God. The next portion of scripture, it's all about perseverance and protection in the world for us. And now we're getting ready to get into another topic of prayer. So Jesus prayed about glory. He prayed about perseverance. Now he's about to pray about sanctification or being holy. Verse 17, make them holy by your truth or sanctify them by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. The Bible, the word of God, the gospel is truth. Te- well, wait a second. How is God going to teach us the truth if Jesus is leaving and he's no longer the teacher on earth? Well, guess what? Jesus covered that when he said that the Holy Spirit will come and lead you into all truth. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus was in one location in Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit can be around the world teaching us all truth. And I'm pretty sure Ephesians 6 says that the spirit, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. And so the spirit uses the word of God to teach us. That's why we need to be in our word because the spirit of God wants to sanctify and teach you. God continues to teach us every time we study the word of God. Now, let me explain to you what it means to be sanctified. Sanctify means set apart, holy, for special use. One commentator put it this way, a believer is to be distinct from the world's sin, its values, and its goals. We don't have the same goals, same values. We don't participate in sin. The means of this sanctifying work is God's truth. The truth is communicated in the word. As the message about Jesus was heard, believed and understood, the disciples' hearts and minds were captured. So the word of God captured their hearts. This change in their thinking and their heart resulted in changes in their living. The same is true for believers today. As we appropriate God's word to our lives, we are sanctified, we are set apart for God, and we change in the way we are living so that we honor God. That's what it means to be sanctified by the word of God, which is truth. Jesus prays that you and I would live holy lives. Why? Be holy for I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. Jesus could have prayed about a lot of things before he dies. He prayed that we would glorify God. He prayed that we would persevere because we're gonna stay in this world until he comes back. And then he prayed for your holiness, that it would grow, that you would be holy. Are we seeing the priorities of Jesus? They're a little different from the world's priorities, aren't they? He wants holiness. We don't fit in. God's word makes us different. He doesn't take us out of this world. He keeps us in it, but he keeps us safe. And the purpose of being sanctified is to send us into the world but not be conformed to it. That's the purpose behind the scripture. Verse 18, here's what he says. Just as you sent me into the world, Father, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Wow, Jesus is saying, I give my life up so that they can be made holy. Because the cross bore all of our sins. Jesus took on all of our sins so that we could be holy. Jesus gave up himself for us so that we could live that way. And now he changes to praying for all believers in verse 20. I'm not praying only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. 
I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. What is Jesus praying about now for all believers? Well, first of all, he's saying that when the disciples preach the gospel, people are going to believe. So now he's praying for all the people who are going to believe. That's us. So Jesus literally is praying for us in this prayer because we've believed the apostles' testimony and the word. And it's passed down from generation to generation, people believing, okay? Now he's saying though, that he's praying, he's praying for our unity. He's praying that we will be in Christ, that we will have a relationship with him. And if we have a relationship with Christ and every single one of us believe in Jesus as believers, that means we're all united and in unity with one another, but we need to behave like it. And that's the hard part. Application is always the hard part. You know, mankind, it's impossible for mankind to live in unity without the grace of God. We will always find something to divide over. There has to be a bonding agent, a uniter, something to glue us together. And it's not mankind, it's God. It's God. And I'll get into some application in a moment, but let's wrap up our scripture. He says, oh, righteous father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them. Again, he loves to glorify God, show who God is. And by the way, um, I have failed to define glory. It's the character, the attributes, the beauty, the truth, the love of God. It's everything God is. God is love. God is truth. It's all those things. That's to glorify God. And Jesus did that. But he's saying now it's our turn to glorify God by the way we live, especially in unity. Verse 26, I have revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be and I will be in them. Praise the Lord. All of that prayer. All of that to bring God glory. We, we hear and we see what really matters to Jesus and he's about to go to the cross, but actually first he goes through a bunch of bogus trials where they just, it's mistrial after mistrial. Let's just put it that way. But what does he pray for? I've already said it. First, the first thing I'm gonna cover the first portion of his prayer for disciples, and I'll come back to glory at the end because it all points to God's glory. Number one, he prays for our perseverance. He doesn't just pray that we would be protected in this world, but he prays, or but he shows us how to actually persevere in this world. I want you to consider this, that Jesus shows us how to persevere through trials when he gets on a knee and washes Judas' feet, knowing full well what Judas was gonna do. When Pastor Kuhn told me that one day, I have not been able to forget it. Jesus washed Judas' feet too. Love for your enemy, your betrayers. He washed Peter's feet. Let's not forget that. Peter was the great denier of them all, unfortunately, right? Not perfect. None of us are. He prays for us when really it should have been the disciples interceding for him but they didn't realize what was really coming yet. They didn't get it yet. And Jesus knew that, so he intercedes for us instead. What about the fact that when they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, again, we're talking about how do you persevere through trials? How do you do the right thing when you're under trial and tribulation? Peter cuts off a person's ear, a a soldier, a guard. Jesus heals his enemy. Sound like something we could do? Pray for our enemies, help them, love them, pray for healing. But that's not it. He's under trial and he could easily call down angels to save him and spare him and do his own will versus God's will. But he embraces God's will and he takes the place of Barabbas. Proving criminal that does deserve punishment and Jesus doesn't. Jesus teaches us how to face our trials. Jesus teaches us how to persevere 
through the hardest time in your life, in my life, is to persevere with the grace of God. And then, just, just, in, just in case you don't know, and, I, and this always touches me and just really blesses me, if it wasn't enough that Jesus goes to the cross and, and covers all of our sin and takes the penalty for it, and then he defeats death and rises again, according to Romans 8.34, it says this, who then will condemn us? No one, especially not Christ, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us, praying for us. I want you to picture the fact that he forfeited the glory by God's side. He forfeited that to come down and live in this messy world to save us. He gets back to his God's glory. He doesn't kick his feet up and go, oh man, that was tough. It's vacation time. No, let me, let, me, let me tell you why I love Jesus so much. He's up there praying for you and I. We don't deserve Jesus. Come on. Wow. He's not kicking back, listening to some tunes and swimming in the heavenly oceans. He's still serving us. What kind of love is that? Man, I just don't feel worthy of that love. But he loves me. And he loves you. And he prayed in this scripture, if we don't take a moment to notice it, we miss it. He prays for our protection. You know, God's praying for your protection. That means you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of when you die because as a believer, you have eternal life because you know eternal life. You know Jesus. We can walk fearless in this world instead of walking in so much fear right now in our world. Well, Ryan, what if I die? Um, death is certain. Death is sudden. It happens out of nowhere. But the promise is we have everlasting life. You know, when things get a little scary and a little close, that, that belief in whether there's resurrection after life starts to get tested, doesn't it? The reality is we have everlasting life. Jesus came back. That's what we're getting ready to celebrate next week. Jesus came back from the dead. I'm not saying do something dumb and risk your life. <laughs> even, even the apostle Paul, they, they pulled him away from serious persecution so he wouldn't be stoned to death. There's, there's wisdom in what you're supposed to do, being spirit-led, so don't get me wrong, don't, don't be chopping this up and putting it on YouTube and go, look what this pastor said. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if it's our time, it's our time. If it's God's will that I go the way I go, then it's God's will for his glory. Again, it was, this whole prayer was all about God's glory. That's part of life is dying. But those who believe in Jesus Christ, they have, the, they have resurrection from death because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We don't have to be afraid. We don't. So persevere. Do not let fear, do not let the fear of this world get into you so much that you don't get into the world and reach it. Secondly, he prays for our holiness. By the way, the way I remember these things is, is this. The first one's perseverance, so go through for the glory of God. Go through whatever you gotta go through. Second of all, holy in an unholy world, he prays for our holiness. Give up whatever you gotta give up. Give up the world to have Jesus. Be holy. Give up this world because Jesus is so much better anyway. It's not even a sacrifice. Jesus is better. It's not, it's not a sacrifice to take the things of this world. No, that's actually a joy to not take the things of this world and to have Jesus instead. Well, I'm giving up this world. I, I'm, this is a huge sacrifice. I'm giving, you're giving up death. Sounds good to me for eternal life. What did we learn last week? Those who, those who lose themselves for the sake of the gospel, save their lives. Those who are willing to lose their life for his sake, save their life because you get eternal life. 
It's worth it. We should be uncomfortable in this world because it's not our world. We're just passing through. We should be a little uncomfortable too, maybe a lot of uncomfortable. <laughs> we should be uncomfortable with the things in this world that, that, that whoa, my, my mic just got louder. There you go. Everyone, God wants you to really hear this. We need to be uncomfortable with some of the things we're seeing in this world that the world is praising. If the world is celebrating and praising something, it's probably a good thing to not celebrate and praise, if you know what I mean. If, if the world is glorifying man and glorifying self and not glorifying God, I wouldn't follow that way. It's okay to be uncomfortable because the world will hate you because they hated God first. You don't fit in and that's okay. Unity. He prays for our unity. You know, are we letting the truth teach us? What are we digesting? What are we digesting? Because this truth unites us. And if we're digesting stuff of this world, then we're not going to be, no pun intended, but maybe I do mean it, we're not going to be on the same page. God gave us his word so that we would be in unity. God gave us his spirit because we're saved by one spirit. There's not more than one. There's one. We're all together in spirit and in truth. Oh, there it is. The truth is the word of God. We're together in spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then we have Jesus as our example. So we follow Jesus. That's how we stay in unity and as one with God. And it's important that you have a a relationship with God, that you're one with God so that you know how to be one with each other. And a lot of people go, a lot of people look at other people as a problem, but actually you got to look at yourself first. I got to look at myself. Am I one with God right now? Am I in unity with his spirit? Am I in unity with his word? Am I doing what his word says? Or am I off and that's why I'm having a problem with my brother or sister in Christ? Because the word of God is truth. And so when we're not following the word of God, we're going to be in conflict with another believer who is off in the word of God as well, not in it. That's why we need to read our Bibles so that we're on the same page. But then you can't just read it. You got to apply it. And we got to appropriate and put to work the word of God. And Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, clothe yourselves in Christ. So we need to have humility and kindness and tenderhearted mercy, forgiveness. We need to reconcile our differences. We need to be corrected and we need to be teachable with the correction. We shouldn't make excuses. Instead, we should be teachable. We should be loving enough to speak the truth in love. When the Bible says confess your sins to one another, we should be able to feel safe to do that, okay? And you know what I always tell people is? I'm going on, ain't I? Here we go. God speaking. This is the word. Sometimes we need to correct ourselves with the word of God. If we let the word of God correct us, someone else won't have to. Because what we'll do is if the word of God corrects us, we'll confess it. Because the word says, they who humble themselves, they will be lifted up. You'll be honored. You'll be, I, I love it when someone comes clean. I don't shame them. I don't make them feel bad. That's, wow, that's beautiful. Way to go. Way to do what God says. To be humble. If we live like that, we'll be in unity. We'll be in unity, church. That's what we need to be like. What is the words I use to remember this portion of the prayer? <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Get over. Get over it, Ryan. Get over it. Overcome that issue with someone. Overcome that conflict. Get over yourself and make things right with that person for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Get over yourself. If they're right, humble yourself and say, you're right. It may hurt at first. You might not talk to them for like three weeks. You know what I'm talking about. 
You know what I'm talking about. And then you come back and you say, you were right. And you said it because you love me, didn't you? Yes, that's why I said it. At first it didn't seem like it, but that's why I said it. You know? The word of God will humble you way before some believer does. We wouldn't have to if we read the word and let it teach us and sanctify us and set us apart and make us holy. Why all those things? For the last one, to bring God glory. To bring God glory. Persevere to bring God glory. Go through this world to bring God glory. Being faithful to him, holy, to be holy. What is that one? Give up some things. Give up self for the glory of God. And lastly, get over some things for the glory of God. Jesus prayed that we would be such a strong church, persevering, holy, and in unity. And the last few verses say, so that the world will see the love of God in us. That sounds like a good reason to go through. Sounds like a good reason to give up some things, to give up this world for Jesus. Sounds like a good reason to get over some things so that the world sees Jesus. Amen. Hey, I'm going to pray about this for a moment. I'm going to pray for our offering. And then I want to close with some announcements. So stay tight real quick. Let's pray over this sermon, and then I'll share a few things what's happening this week coming up at Calvary. Lord, don't feel worthy, but you love us anyway. To pray for us like this, wow. To be facing the cross moments later, but to pray for us like this, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for loving us and thank you for teaching us how to go through trials. To pray to you that we would bring you glory. To pray for our fellow believers. To pray for perseverance. To pray for sanctification. That God, you, you let us go through things to, to perfect us and to make us holy. And God, we thank you, Lord. That God, we can be in unity with the body of Christ to help us get through these things. To help us get through this world. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for that. Lord, we do it all for your glory. Thank you for loving us so much that you're still praying for us. We're blessed by that today. Lord, we give this offering to you as an act of worship today. We thank you, God, for your provision, for the jobs that we have, for for all the, the resources that we have, Lord. And we obey you, God, and give back to you, Lord. We give to you what is yours For your glory, God, use it, Lord. Thank you for this church and what we're doing, even this weekend, using our finances to reach souls. God, magnify it, multiply these efforts. Lord, we thank you that when a seed falls on good soil, it multiplies the fruit so much that there's more than what we think we're accomplishing, God, even more so. So God, use the gifts that we give today, whether it's at home, online, or in this room, use it to be glorified, Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for your provision, your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.